everybody. Thank you very much for coming today. Is the um, screen okay, or do you want the blackout curtains closed, or is that easy enough? <coughs> Maybe we should turn off a couple of lights. But can you still see your potato chips? <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to accidentally eat a cucumber when you're trying to eat a potato chip. That would be the worst. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today. We are going to be giving you an introductory talk to Level 7 DCI, Touching the Diamond World. The ideas and information in this level are really going deeper into the ideas about the pen. And that's why we ask people to come who had come before, so that it's not all brand new concepts for you. It's going to be easier for you guys to understand where we're going with this. This information is kind of rare, a little bit hard to find, and you don't hear about it just every day. So how did we get to be here in this room? For me, there's a set of circumstances that happened. Adam met Katie. Kelly met Morgan. <laughs> I met Janice. And Janice invited me to go hear a talk in Arizona and things kind of steamrolled from there. So there's a set of circumstances that, that happen. Where do those things come from? How did we get the seeds to be able to hear ideas about where things come from, the deeper explanation of where things come from? When we were children, maybe you remember this or maybe you've had children, there's a phase, I think, when kids are about three or four, where they start asking why. Why? Okay, eat your cheese sandwich. Why? <laughs> because that cheese sandwich is going to make you strong and grow. Why? Well, the, the calories inside the cheese and the bread will feed your body and your body will get stronger. Why? She says. And then at some point, the parent says, just because. Because the, the child drills down, drills down, drills down to a place where there is really no explanation that I can give you or I just want you to be quiet. So <laughs> I say just because or stop asking why. But some people aren't satisfied with that and they keep asking why. Why are things the way they are? And that wondering plants seeds for us to get more information and to be able to be in places where people are looking for the answers of why things are the way they are. So we're special, you guys are really special that you're interested, and you could have been doing something else today. You could have been playing Frisbee. Uh, well, it's not as nice a day as it could be, but it is springtime, the blossoms are out, you know, it's nice to be outside. So you could be playing Frisbee, you could be um, having a fancy lunch at a restaurant, or you could be doing what I often do, which is working at my desk and eating at the same time. <laughs> That's not optimum. So thanks for taking the time out of your busy day. And the point that I'd like to make is that, you know, we've planted some special seeds in the past of sharing information with others and being curious that have helped us get here. So now that we're here, now what? You're going to hear something today. And it's like my favorite song, Joni Mitchell, Blue. And uh, I don't know, some of you are way too young to probably care about that song. But, <laughs> but I love it, and it, it pulls on my heartstrings. And if Ben and I are in the car together and I turn that up full blast, Ben is going to be dying a slow death. <laughs> so we don't all hear things the same way. You know, my favorite song is not necessarily your favorite song. So my voice is going to be traveling out, Janice's beautiful voice is going to be traveling out, and we're not all going to hear it the same way. So not only do we have special circumstances to get us into this room, but depending on the day and who we are and all the different factors, we may hear something that helps us, we may hear something that changes us in a dramatic way, we may be curious to learn more later, or it may just come in and out and really not matter to us, or you may fall asleep. Hopefully you're too polite 
<laughs> to actually <laughs> fall over in your chair. So we call that ears to hear. You know, you may or may not have the ears to hear. We may not express it in a way that, that means something to you, but we're going to try. And, um, you know, hopefully we have the seeds we've planted in the past so that we can say something coherent to you today. And the great thing about the diamond cutter system is if you don't like what we're saying, it's because of your seeds. And if you like what we're saying, it's because of our seeds. <laughs> oh, so this lady, you know, she, I just feel like she's getting into this music more than someone else might. So that's why I chose that picture. She's having a special experience that not, not everyone who hears that guitar player is going to have. So I think all of you know I'm Alex. Janice and Katie are the co-presenters today. We're Diamond X speakers, which means we are a subsidiary, city, subsidiary of Diamond Cutter Institute, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. We're studying down in Sedona. We've been down for seven sessions. Now we go down for two weeks at a time to learn how to present and, and go deeply into the diamond cutter ideas. We are heading down for session eight here just in a couple of weeks, so we're excited about that. That topic is gonna to be leadership. But this topic, as you know, is level seven, and it's about core reality. Where does success come from? I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about the founder of Diamond Cutter Institute, Geshe Michael Roach. Most of you have heard that he wrote this book, The Diamond Cutter, because he had a very successful company. And um, everyone wanted to know, how did he make his success? And because of this book and the popularity of it, he started the Diamond Cutter Institute to share with business audiences particularly, and professionals of all different kinds, the ideas of the diamond cutter. But the story is a little bit deeper. In 1975, Geshe Michael graduated from Princeton University, and he became very interested in the ancient Asian ideas. He had some tragedies in his life that were really causing him to ask why. He lost both of his parents and one of his brothers all in one year. And he was really looking for answers of why, and it led him to go study in both India and in New Jersey, of all places. There was a teacher in a monastery, and he moved to the monastery and lived there for several years. So what happened was Geshe Michael delved into these ideas and got a very deep understanding of them. And because of that, his teacher gave him a homework assignment. And the homework assignment was take these ideas and prove that they work in everybody's everyday life. So the process was he mastered the ideas and then he didn't want to be in business particularly really at all. He wanted to have a monastic life and just study the teachings and meditate. But because of uh, his teacher's urging, he went and proved the ideas. So in, uh, it was um, 1981. He went to New York City and got a job in a very small company called Andon International. There was three of them, and they got a $50,000 loan. It was a diamond business, jewelry business company. And so they started that in 1981. When he left the company in 1999, he was vice president, and their sales were $100 million a year in sales. One of the fastest growing companies in the history of New York City. And he did it all using the ideas that we're talking about today. Does anyone know where this is? Grand Central. Grand Central Station. Have you been there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. So I've also been there. I used to live in New York City, and I went to a college called Sarah Lawrence, which was outside the city. So to come to my coat check job at the restaurant, I don't know. You know, we don't really have coat checkers here in Durango. But in New York City, there is such a job as the coat check girl. Um, so that was my job, and I traveled through Grand Central Station to get to work. There is so much activity in this Grand Central Station. There's people going every which way. And there's smells of pretzels and hot dogs and all the food. The sounds are deafening. 
And there's people standing in the way, tourists who have just come to see Grand Central Station and actually have no idea where the ticket counter is, where the trains are. And then there's people who go through here twice a day, and they know exactly where they're going, and they're going 100 miles per hour. And right. then there's the flash mob. The, oh, and flash mob, <laughs> which I never saw. <laughs> but that would definitely add to it. So this is surface reality. This is our senses, the whole um, symphony of activity that is touching our senses all the time. But most of the people here in Grand Central Station never stop to think about what is underneath the station. So under the station in Manhattan, there is granite and marble, very solid rock. And that's why they can build really tall skyscrapers there, because this foundation is so strong. And this is what our metaphor is for core reality. Core reality is silent. It's, it's, you know, you're not hearing it when you're in Grand Central Station. And it's invisible. You're not seeing it. It's also unchanging. Rock does change over time. I know scientists are going to be like, wait a second. <laughs> but in this metaphor, compared to the busyness of Grand Central Station, the bedrock underneath is very solid and unchanging. Okay, so we're going to refer back to this metaphor um, today a few times. The surface reality is what's going on in our daily lives. Everything that we're seeing, the phone ringing, and we're being pulled in a lot of different directions. People are needing help from us, and we are also trying to meet our needs. And this keeps us on the move. But what holds that up? I mean, those of us who are wondering why, what is the source? What is the source of success? We have this feeling that there's something more, that there's a, a hidden reality. And that's what we're going to delve in today, is exploring this hidden reality, silent, unchanging reality. So that's all I'm going to say about that right now. And I think Katie is going to give us a little review on some things that you may have heard before, but she's going to give it to us in a special way. <laughs> all right. So has anybody not heard the pen thing? Good. Okay, I used to do hop keto in college. Um, I thought it would be really cool, and I was probably the worst person in the class. But they made us practice falling, which I also hated. But they made us practice falling because there's a special way to fall where if you roll, you can roll without hurting yourself. You can even fall from a very high height, and you wouldn't hurt yourself. So they made us practice this, and they did it because they wanted us to get muscle memory. So if we needed it, we could fall and not hurt ourselves. So that's why we have to repeat the pen thing. Because just like in Hapkido with falling, we want this to become part of your muscle memory. So that when you start thinking about reality, you can start thinking about where are things really coming from. And I also had a dream last night where I forgot how to teach the pen thing. So <laughs> as I'm going through it today, if I forget anything, since you guys have all heard it, you can let me know. <laughs> OK, so play along. What is this thing? Okay. Yeah. Good, you guys have heard this before. Okay, now let's pretend that Coda was in the room. He is. I know. <laughs> and I said, Coda, come here. <laughs> and he's trying, sort of. And what would Coda do with this thing? So it's a chew toy. Right, so he would chew it. So now the dog sees a pen, or the dog sees a chew toy, and the human sees a pen. Who's right? Oh, both. Okay, so now this is the next very important question. Suppose I set this thing on the table here, and I tell you guys the talk is over, you all gotta leave. So then we all leave the room. <laughs> I leave the room, everybody's gone. Coda leaves the room, nobody's in the room. And this thing is just there. So at this time, what is this? A pen or a chew toy? Oh. And Morgan has like the right answer. Morgan's kind of going like this. And that's the right answer because, you know, this thing at that time, it's available, it's potential. You could even say it's empty, or it's nothing. And that's all that we mean by the very ancient idea of emptiness that we talk about in the ancient books. It's actually kind of simple, but it's, as you delve into it, it gets a little more hard to understand. But, okay, so now since I walked back in the room, because I am constantly leaving things lately, you know, I have a lot to keep track of, so I walk back in the room, 
I'm looking for my sunglasses or my things, and my eye catches sight of this thing. So then it becomes a pen. So since it only becomes a pen when I walk back in the room and catch sight of it, or if Coda walks back in the room and catches sight of it, it becomes a chew toy. Can we really say that the penness is coming from the pen, or is the penness coming from me? Coming from you. Yeah. Right, you guys have all done this before. Show me with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Muscle memory. Okay, so the pen is coming from me. So if the pen is coming from me, does that mean it could become anything I want? Like a big diamond? Or all the lit remaining episodes of Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> all right, if I use positive thinking, can I turn this pen into a thousand dollars? Let's all try, let's all close our eyes. We're gonna use positive thinking, we're gonna think really hard, and we're gonna try and turn this into a big pile of $100 bills. Okay, ready? Wish, 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 wish. Nope, still a pen. So though the pen is coming from me, it's not coming from me because I want it to. Something else is going on there. So what's going on is I have a seed in my mind for a pen. So when I walk back in the room and my eye catches sight of this thing, what happens is a seed, we're using the word seed to explain it because it's a good metaphor, a seed opens in my mind. And out of that seed comes a luminous image. And this luminous image is in the perfect shape what I call a pen. You can even think of it like a label or a sticker that goes on things. So this luminous image comes out and lays over this and boom, it becomes a pen. And that is how everything in our world is. Alex, Morgan, the pens on your table. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly, whose name I forgot. All right, so then how do we use this information? How do we use the fact that things are coming from us in order to create what we want in the world. Because we can actually do that. We can make a thousand dollars. So first, we have to decide what you want. That's the first thing. You can't get anything if you don't know what you want. So I really want a thousand dollars. Complete that in a short sentence. So I want a thousand dollars. Step number two, I have to choose somebody else who wants the same thing. And you know, usually, you know, say you want a boyfriend, and you say that to find a boyfriend, you need to find a lonely person to help. And you're like, well, I don't know any lonely people. Well, chances are you haven't really thought about it before because you haven't thought about the system, helping someone else get the same thing that you want. So chances are if you take 24 hours, you're going to find 10 <coughs> people who want what you want. So I think I might know 10 people in this room who want what I want. Who all wants $1,000 or money? Who all wants money? <laughs> Right, everybody wants money. And I'm going to help someone get what they want. So who really wants money? <laughs> well, Garrett looked like he really wanted money. His hand was up first. All right. Would you mind coming up here? Sure. <laughs> All right. So we're going to stand in the middle here. All right, so do you want money? Yes. Okay, so I just confirmed he wants what I want. All right, so now I actually have to do something. I have to help Garrett get what he wants in order to plant a seed for what I want. All right, so if you would hold up your hand, please. Hold it up high. All right. <laughs> so now we're going to plant a seed, and you're going to see how easy it is. We can all go out and do it right after this talk. Okay, ready? We're going to plant a seed. Ready? One. Two. Oh, see, this is real money. I didn't just print it with Photoshop. <laughs> okay, ready? This is a better investment than the stock market. Ready? One, two, three. I just planted a seed. All right, you can keep it. Take it over out to dinner. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so we just planted a real life seed, and I encourage you to use that as homework and go try it. So now, sometimes you've seen it in real life. Um, you can plant a seed, but it doesn't necessarily grow. I, for instance, always try to plant tomatoes every spring, and they never grow. <laughs> so you, I just now learned you actually have to water them. <laughs> just kidding, I do that. But um, So it's the same thing with mental seeds. You actually have to water them, and you do that doing a special meditation. And we call it coffee meditation, which has a cool story why it's called that, and I keep promising you guys I'll tell you, but I'll tell you later. So. 
For coffee meditation, it's not like the normal one where you sit cross-legged with your back straight. This one, it's more like this, or on your pillow. I tend to do it on my stomach with my face in my pillow. <laughs> and all you're going to do is you're going to think about the good thing that you did. The fact that I just gave Garrett $100 and you know, the look on his face when I gave it to him, how happy it made him, the fact that he can go spend it on Morgan, <laughs> or on something he wants, <laughs> or he plant more seeds afterwards. And I think about how happy it made him and how happy I am I was able to do that. And that by using this system, what would the world be like if everyone was doing it? If everybody thought that in order to get something, they had to give something first. We were talking about that yesterday, what a different place we would live in. And so as I'm doing this meditation, at the end of the day, this is what pours water on my seeds. This is like sunlight, fertilizer, water for your mental seeds. All right, so now we're going to keep going into deeper reality and how to plant the very best seed that you can plant. Thank you, Katie. First, I have to test if I know how to do this thing. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. <laughs> so let's see, let's get back to that slide. So if we're going to find our success, we first have to understand what it looks like, right? So today what we want to know is what does core reality look like? Because when we understand the source of our success, we can indirectly or directly, we can then use this knowledge to reach all of our goals. Remember we had we learned about five goals. You know, first of all, we want to have money. Secondly, we want to have good relationships. Third, we want to have great health so we can enjoy those relationships. And four, what's the point of all that if we don't have inner peace? And five, then once we get all those things, we really understand that we want to help other people. So we, we've got those five goals. We want to understand our core reality so we can use it to plant the success of our, that we want in our lives. So. What does this core reality look like? Does it look like bedrock? No, it doesn't. But let's review a little bit. Katie just taught us about the pen. And we understood when she was telling us that the pen is not coming this way. It's coming from us, from our seeds. In our core, in our surface reality, that busy Grand Central Station, we all believe that the apparent cause for getting anything we want is that Perhaps if we want a pen, for instance, we're going to use a pen because we've been talking about that all day. So if I want a pen, the apparent cause for that pen is that it's probably made in a factory, maybe in Taiwan or China, and then it gets thrown onto a boat and shipped here, thrown on a truck and delivered to a store like Fetches, mm -hmm. and then we all have to have money to go to Fetches and buy a pen, right? That's how it appears. But the real reality, the real reason you can get a pen, has an ethical component. How have you treated other people in the past week? Have you helped them get what they need? That's the only way to get a pen. We have to get, we have to plant the seeds to see a pen by helping others get what they want. Have we shared pens? Have we shared, you know, communication skills? If we have, then when I walk into the room. I'm going to see a pen instead of a chew toy because I've created the seeds for myself to see a pen. And that gets us back to when um, Katie left the room, Coda left the room, and she left this thing here. It's empty of being self-existent. It doesn't come from its own side. Otherwise, when Coda walked up here and saw that pen, Coda wouldn't chew on that pen. Coda would write a letter to his doggy girlfriend, right? So the pen, does Coda have a doggy girlfriend? No, so the pen is coming from us. So let me ask you this. If the pen is coming from us, what about the food or the lights or the screen or the person sitting next to you? They're coming from us too. How I see Kelly, it's coming from my seeds. If I like Kelly and I'm happy she's here, that's because I've planted seeds of liking someone else and helping them enjoy the companions around them. Everything in our reality is coming from us. And when we understand that everything in our reality is coming from us, that gives us power. What does it give us power to do? Well, if you're not enjoying this talk, or if you're just having a bad week, 
you now have the power, the knowledge, to change it. Because if the world is coming from us, we now have the tools to start planting different seeds for a better reality next week. And if we want to have a specific thing in our life, like if we want to plant the seed for $1,000, we could use the four steps and starting with that today. Find someone who wants what we want and help them get it. Katie wants $1,000. She planted the seeds for it. So we could use that technique ourselves and plant a specific thing that we want in our lives. And I encourage you to do this so you can prove that this system works. And that gets us to core reality. What does it look like? Um, Alex said it's a metaphor. You know, it's the bedrock beneath that busy surface reality of Grand Central Station. It's the quiet, unseen thing that allows Grand Central Station to stand there. Without that bedrock, you know, Grand Central Station is going to fall into a sinkhole like it's developing in Silverton. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> developing into a sinkhole. There wouldn't be any Grand Central Station, there'd be no Manhattan because there's nothing there to support it. But um, the real bedrock that we're going to talk about is um, core reality. We want to know what core reality It's the force that allows everything to exist. Every existing thing has to have this core reality. Okay, so now I can quote that to you, but still, what is it? It's the emptiness of anything that, there's nothing, it's the absence of anything that is self-existent. The pen isn't a pen until we walk in with the seeds to see it as a pen. There's nothing that exists without our seeds, okay? So core reality actually isn't physical. It's, um, it's an invisible part that's in all of us. It's unseen and it's silent, but it allows all of us and all things to exist as we see them now. So, <laughs> let me tell you a little story. That's Red Mountain Pass this winter, and it's all snowed in and the roads got closed. So this is going to be an example of how core reality works for us. So Red Mountain Pass was closed this winter for 19 days in March. And March is a pretty significant month because it's spring break for a lot of people from Texas and well, people everywhere. So what do they do? They travel. They, they would travel on those roads and visit towns like Uray and Silverton and perhaps spend money there. So the closure of Red Mountain Pass for those days, if you happen to be a retailer in Silverton or Uray, it was a bad thing because all that traffic from the north wasn't able to drive through Uray to get to Silverton. All the traffic from Albuquerque here to the south didn't go through Silverton to get to Uray. So we lost money. Is that a bad thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's a bad thing. <laughs> it is a bad thing. We agree. Okay. But on the other hand, let's say I had a gas station in Dolores, and all of a sudden, all that traffic from the north was rerouted over Lizard Head Pass through Dolores to get to Durango or Cortez, and vice versa. Routed through Dolores and over Lizard Head Pass to get to Montrose. They had a plethora of cars and traffic coming through their town. And that means they sold more hamburgers, more milkshakes, more gasoline. So it's a good thing for them, right? Yeah. So it's a good thing for people in Dolores. It's a bad thing for merchants in Silverton and um, Uray, right, right? Yeah. Okay. And what? <laughs> let's, I'm just really wanting to get this clear. So what if you were a road worker and there was mileage, miles and miles of pass just inundated with deep 30-foot avalanches. You know, they had to work overtime and didn't get to spend time with their families. That's a bad thing, right? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Maybe it's a good thing. It depends. Good. You're on the same track. Okay. But what if they got paid overtime and comp tank? That would be a good thing, right? So what I'm getting at here, the event itself, is either neutral or empty of existing from its own side. Red Mountain Pass could be closed, and it's either a good event or a bad event, depending upon who's looking, whose seats are opening at that time. So everything, every event in our lives, either has the risk of great loss or great unhappiness, you know, when you're unhappy, or it has the potential for great profit or a favorable result that makes you happy. Do we agree? Mm -hmm. So, when we understand that the core reality is actually the emptiness of anything being self-existent, 
Then we have a general sense of what it is. It's invisible, we can't see it, but it's all around us. Every one of us in here has the same identical emptiness. We're all empty of existing from our own side. It's just like the pen. The pen doesn't become a pen for the dog because they don't have a seat for it. So whatever we're experiencing, it's coming from us. And then that gives us the power to plant what we want. Okay, so what does a person become? What does that look like when a person actually experiences this core reality directly? And I want to uh, tell you something like, it's, we also call core reality emptiness. You know, so a lot of times I interchange those phrases just to make it clear. You know, we'll have the same phrase for the same topic, core reality or emptiness. Well, when this person goes into the direct perception of emptiness, it takes them about 20 minutes while they're in it. But the person that they enter as is so different from the person they become after they've had this experience. It's on the scale of evolution as a single-celled organism to the mind of Einstein. I mean, they're so much greater evolved than us. They're, they understand their reality without doubt. They understand every moment that the world is coming from them. They have no doubt about it. And they become the innovators, the innovators that we've heard of through history, throughout history and throughout all cultures and it crosses all religions. And these people, they have this great desire to teach other people what they've achieved because they know it's the source of our success. And they want others to have that same success. So these people also, since it's only a 20 minute experience, when they come out of it, out of that direct experience of seeing how they're creating their world and seeing it directly, moment by moment, instant by instant, everything that they do is creating results that are going to happen next week. Then when they come out of it, they go back to seeing things the wrong way. They see things that apparent way, that to, buy a, to get a pen, we have to pay for it instead of helping other people. So they often look for a talisman, a talisman to help remind them of the experience they had. So they go looking for some ultimate thing in our universe because they just had an ultimate experience. Well, guess what? There are no ultimate things in our universe because you can always make something worse or you can make it better, shorter, or you can add an inch to a ruler and make it longer. You can make your coffee sweeter or this, uh, you can make your soup saltier. There's no ultimate. There can always be more or less of something except the diamond is the closest thing to an ultimate that we have. And why is that? Because a diamond is the hardest thing in our universe. Nothing can scratch a diamond except another diamond. So they use diamonds in drilling, um, like in, I used to work at a mine and we had a lot of diamond drillers and uh, well those diamond drillers they had drills with diamond, little commercial diamond grade diamond that could cut through volcanic rock and all this hard material because diamond is the hardest thing in our universe. And it's also the metaphor, because it's the hardest thing, it cuts through the deceptive reality of seeing things coming this way. So when that person who's experienced the direct experience of emptiness pulls out that diamond, they remember things are coming this way. And secondly, a diamond is invisible. If there is a wall of diamond between us, you might not see it if you walked up here to pull me off the stage. Yeah, you would hurt yourself. <laughs> but a diamond is completely invisible if it's a pure diamond and it's large and covering this room, okay? But core reality, or it's invisible too. We don't see it. But everything has its own emptiness. The uh, Lacroix cans, you know, however you pronounce it, we've all pronounced it different ways. But those little cans of pop, they are all empty of what we call it. It depends on who's seen it and who's naming it. So we all have the same identical emptiness. And um, the invisibility is also a metaphor for the clarity with which uh, we will see emptiness directly if we remove the cataracts from our own eyes. So that brings us to our final metaphor, 100% 100%. Diamonds are made of pure carbon. They're compressed at extreme temperatures and pressure, and it forces carbon to become this clear, beautiful, refractive crystal of diamond. Well, diamond, although it's the hardest thing in the universe, 
it's made up of little cleavage lines in it. And if you're a diamond cutter, you can cut those lines and you can cut them along those cleavage lines. So if I were to smash a diamond and break it into a hundred pieces, every diamond particle would be a hundred percent pure diamond. And it's a metaphor for the emptiness around us. Every emptiness is 100% pure emptiness. Everything is 100% empty of existing from its own side. So now I just want you to imagine living a life full of love and fearlessness of how you would act if you knew 100% without doubt that you were creating your own reality all of the time. How would you act? You would be brave and fearless in creating your world and creating a world and helping others to learn it. And that's our goal today, to help everybody here experience it indirectly by just hearing the pin so that we can plant the seeds to actually one day see it directly. And just by being here, you guys have the ears to hear this and you're already planting the seeds to accomplish the, our goal for each one of us here, to see it directly and make a huge difference in all of our reality. All right, thank you. And Alex is now going to uh, talk about where this emptiness or this core reality is in the universe. And let's take a five minute break oh. so you guys can grab another cookie uh, if you want any seconds or anything. Or the, the restroom is right down the hall here. So we'll just take a real quick break in case anyone needs second sandwich. Second, second, second breakfast. Second breakfast. <laughs> <laughs>